I want to get started tonight. I, I, I've been working in John 5 this week, and it's a, it's a book that takes an interesting turn about midway through. It starts with this story of the, the pool of Bethesda, which we spent some time with uh, two weeks ago. And then last week, we, we, we took the Sabbath portion of the story, which is really the underpinning of the Bethesda story, because he's doing this on a Sabbath. And so John wants to focus you there for a little bit. And so I thought a week's worth of focusing you there was appropriate as well, because our lives are lives built around he who is the Sabbath. Jesus becomes our day of rest. It's, to me, far more glorious to live in a Sabbath than to have a Sabbath. <laughs> you can live in the Sabbath and rest in who you are and do that all the time while being a producer. We're, we are citizens of the kingdom, not consumers in the kingdom. Um, what's that mean? Uh, that means that we do something with our citizenship. We don't just take things with our... I don't like the phrase uh, consumer say, you know, and we've, we've been denigrated to consumers in our modern economy rather than citizens. And we're a little bit that way in the kingdom. What can I get from God? What can I get from God? What can I get from God? That's a consumer mentality. A citizen mentality is, here's who I am in God. What can I do with it in the world? If you get that citizen mentality and from a place of rest, Christ is your Sabbath. And so then you do something great in the world rather than just wait on a day off or wait on a day of rest. And so it's, to me, it's far better. That tilt right there in John where Jesus starts to talk, he's not acting so much on the man at Bethesda anymore. Now he's talking not just to the man at Bethesda, but the people around, because he's been very controversial miracle. It's performed on the Sabbath. And now Jesus, who has been flying below the radar in John, really, he hasn't done much. Who gets mad at a guy that turns water to wine? Who gets mad that at a guy that leaves the country to go do miracles. It's not as if he's doing anything to harm the Jews. That's the woman at the well. The nobleman's son, that's a good thing. You heal a guy's son that's a, that's a member of, of the nation. But then when he starts to do these on the Sabbath, this is a problem. So if you're going to jump into the water, you might as well jump into the deep end of the pool. This is the way Jesus treats John 5. And so if we're going to get into verbal sparring, we might as well get into it for something serious. And so Jesus gets in his first real verbal confrontation of the book of John. It will not be his last, but it, what a fitting one to get into. So much so that John tries to make this a thread that runs through the book. And I'm going to try to do that with John tonight. There's a thread that runs through John of Jesus declaring a judgment and explaining it and then showing it. And I want to go down that thread a little bit tonight, rather than just touching this subject as we hit it, because we'll hit it throughout John. I want to take the sort of the body of it and, and give you one night on it. And so I want to deal with the judgment that's committed to the Son, because Jesus tells us there's a judgment committed to himself. To do that, I want to do some Greek work first. Because I want to start to lay the groundwork of where I think Jesus is going. So I want to start our 32nd lesson in John by going to the book of Acts, which makes no sense, I know. How can you discuss John while opening in Acts? Well, in Acts 17, Paul goes to Athens and he starts to minister to Gentiles and he speaks to them of the, 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 the gods that they serve and the unknown God. And he, he begins to comment to them about a resurrected Jesus. And he makes a couple of comments in Acts 17, 30, 31 that I want to, to use to, to sort of establish this judgment that comes through Christ. Paul says this, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now this is a popular moment. I know we're in John, so for us this is totally outside of our purview for the most part. I think you're going to see in a moment why I'm doing this. But 
It's an important moment because Paul's establishing that up until now, man has been ignorant on the ways of God, but because of a man named Jesus, you can't claim ignorance any longer. Now you know what God looks like, and you know what God loves like, and you know how God heals, and you know how God moves because you've seen Jesus. But we're dealing with Gentiles who don't know all of those things. They didn't, these guys in Athens haven't watched Jesus live and move. But Paul still declares that ignorance is no longer an excuse because something's being proclaimed. The love of God is being proclaimed. The message of grace is being proclaimed. And so now everywhere, everybody needs to change their mind. That's the base understanding of repent. It's time for man, Jew and Gentile alike, to change his mind about God, repent, because, why? Because God has set a day on his calendar. He's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. New King James giving you all these capitalizations, capital M, capital H, probably not bad. We're talking about, the pronoun here is definitely talking about Jesus because Jesus is the man whom God has ordained and gave us assurance to this day by raising, capital H, him from the dead, who's God raised from the dead but Jesus. So our central character in this story is Jesus. God has appointed a day in which God will judge the world by Jesus and he'll do it in righteousness. So I want to take a look for a moment at this phrase world because this is an important thing to understand when you study Well, it's an important thing to understand when you study the New Testament, first of all. It's also, I think, very important when you start to study Bible prophecy. I'm not going to claim to be laying out an eschatology lesson tonight, but we definitely got to brush up against some things that would have been eschatological. And by eschatology, I mean study of the end, in the day of the disciples, in the time of Christ. You can't move outside of that too far when you get into the language of judgment. And that's what I want to try to prove to you tonight, because I think what's happening... Let me just say this up front rather than saving something like this thought as a summary. This may be a good way to lead. I think a lot of our mistake in talking about judgment is that we assume judgment to be a one-time event way out in our future in which everybody gets theirs. The good get theirs and the bad get theirs. And we don't look at judgment as something exacted in our past. I'm not saying they aren't both true, but I think most Christians have ignored the one in their past. And all they're doing is focusing on one in their future. And if you don't get the one in your past correct, I promise you, you'll get the one in your future wrong. It's that important that we get the judgment in our past correct theologically, or we'll never get any judgments in our future correct. We will end up tonight at, the, at a judgment in our future. But I will never again in my life teach a future judgment without a past one. Because I have a Bible in front of me that tells me the story of Jesus. And John has a ribbon running through him. And the ribbon running through John is judgment. And where is it? In this man Christ. How can I ignore that so that I can deposit fear of a future judgment in you and give you no release on what might have happened in a past judgment. One of the ways to do that is to isolate what God is talking about when he talks about the world. Because for us, when I'm in my church experience, this is me, this is, I'm not trying to say this is universal. In my church experience, anytime inside of the church walls, someone used the phrase, the world, they meant those bunch of sinners. Okay, so if someone said, love not the world, I mean, well, love not all that bunch of sinners. Um, some of you have been out in the world this week. That meant like bars and, and uh, you know, strip joints or whatever. You've been out in the world, and it could even be something as simple as you went to the movies. That's the world. You went to an amusement park. That's the world. You've been dating someone that's not a Christian. That's the world. And so the world was this big blanket thing. It wasn't even that way in the New Testament, by the way. So why is it that way for us? It wasn't. Okay, let's look at the Greek. 
The word world is translated from one of three Greek words in the New Testament. I want to walk you through those three. And I, I, I want to say as a disclaimer that I am certainly no Greek expert. I've taken my courses in Greek and I study in the Greek as much as I can. And I try to, I try to mine out what I can from the Greek. What, what little bit I do know, I can tell you this. It's difficult to go word to word, Greek to English, because the Greek is multi-layered and it's colorful and it's written in... It's, it's the, the language that we have doesn't use punctuation when it comes down to us. And so our translators are oftentimes dropping commas and periods and semicolons and exclamation points and quote marks. And they're trying to add words because the word doesn't make sense by itself. And they're trying to get the English syntax to flow properly and they can't. So they put in italicized words. And we get a little, you can get frustrated studying the Greek because you look at the English and go, what, how am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do with this? But we can also get frustrated when we stop when we don't realize that the Greek language has so many different words that get put into the same English word that we lose on our end. We lose because our translators are using a word that has a lot of different meanings in the Greek. The first example is the Greek word cosmos. I put 187 times. What I mean by that in the parentheses is that this where it appears 187 times in the New Testament. And I want, you're going to notice as we unfold the other two that this is big. That's a big number. 187 times the Greek word cosmos is translated world. What cosmos means is the earth, but it also means both the earth and the universe at large. It's really this whole planet you're spinning on. It's, this, it's, not, it's not spiritual as much as it is literal. We talk about, they didn't call it planet earth. What they call it? Cosmos. And so the cosmos is all of it. And so the cosmos, here's an example. I wanted to use a text and I just, I used a part of it because everybody knows this. What does it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I wanted to show you cosmos in the Greek. What would it profit a man if he gained the whole earth? This isn't a spiritual statement. It's, it's kind of a psychological statement Jesus is saying to you is, hey, what good would it do you if you owned everything, but you had no happiness or peace or rest or stability or meaning in life? To lose your soul is to lose the seatbelt of your emotions. I think we see every day people who chase after having things, but they have nothing. They have a lot of stuff, but they have nothing to stabilize their soul, to keep them grounded, to keep them at peace. And Jesus asked, what would it profit you if you had all the cosmos, everything you can imagine in the natural, but you didn't have the stability in yourself. That's one usage in the Greek. Okay, here's another one. Oikomene. Only 15 times. That's relatively, that's hardly used at all relative to the size of cosmos. Oikomene means the inhabited world. That's not the world at large. This is the world as we know it and the people in it. When, there went out a decree from, from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Remember this in Luke 2, 1? And the word used for world is oikomene, and that makes sense when you consider the fact that Caesar can't tax the North America. So the writer doesn't say cosmos. He says all the world. But if you're reading that in Luke 2 and you're trying to be critical, you could say the Bible doesn't know what it's talking about. Caesar can't tax the whole world. The writer doesn't mean Caesar taxes the whole world. The English makes it look like G Caesar taxes the whole world. In the Greek, Caesar only taxes, and by the way, inhabited is really thin there too. What I mean by inhabited world was the inhabited world that mattered to them. Okay? In other words, if you're saying this in a Roman sense, then what you mean is there went out a decree from Caesar that all the Roman Empire should be taxed. That'd be another way to say that. If you use oikomene in the Greek, you're saying the world that matters to us. Because the world that doesn't matter to us are people outside of our purview. We couldn't care less about them. They don't exist at all. In fact, a Jew would commonly refer to them as barbarians and strangers. I mean, they're just wild people outside of the Roman. We don't, what are they? Are they even human? I don't know. And we think that's ridiculous, but that's the exact same thing that happened when, when uh, explorers got off the boat in the Americas and said, is this, are these humans? I mean, we, we look at that now and think that's crazy, but that's sort of the mindset that's been throughout. Okay, there's another one. Ion, 
is used 128 times. That's significantly more than the inhabited world, but slightly less than cosmos. Here's your second most used Greek word, and I own is period of time or age. I'll give you an example, Matthew 24, 3. It's the next screen. I, I, it was a little long, and I wanted to read it all. Here, watch Ion. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Some translations say the end of the world, but it's the word ion. It's the end of the age. So the disciples are not saying, when's the world going to end? The disciples are, can you go back a screen? What does, what does ion mean? Period of time. A, a distinct period of time. So now go to the text, 24-3. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? What will be the end of this period of time? And what period of time? The only period of time that mattered to them. And so that's why Matthew 24, we use as a prophetic passage to talk about the end of that mosaic time, that the end of that time period that had been their entire world, their ion. It gets used more than once. And I'll give another example. I didn't put this on the screen, but um, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember that? Romans 12 too. Be not conformed to this ion. Don't be conformed to this age. Don't be conformed to this period of time. And so it's a very pointed statement. Now, why did I give you all of that? Acts 17, 31. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. The oidomine. You can't tell that when you read it in English. Remember I told you it was only used 15 times in the New Testament? The inhabited earth. It happens right here. He has appointed a day on which he will judge the oidomine in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. There's a day in which he is going to confine a judgment to the only inhabited world we think matters, Paul says. Seems like the wrong word. And it seems like Paul should have said, because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the cosmos in righteousness. That would mean he judges the whole thing. But I'm here to show you that the New Testament was obsessed with different judgments. They were obsessed with a judgment in the time of Christ. They were obsessed with a judgment that was coming in their generation. And there's also a New Testament reference to any judgment that happens in the future. And I'm going to show you what that looks like before we're finished tonight. But I want to focus tonight primarily on the judgment committed to the Son. And to do that, we want to go to the book of John. So we spent a lot of time there in Acts, spent a lot of time with some Greek, spent a lot of time kind of working around a little bit because I wanted to really get you to understand judgment through their lens. So let's look at John chapter 5 and beginning in verse 19. Jesus answered, and this is about where we finished last week, okay? So I know there's a lot of things that we moved around and moved with last week, but I, we ended right in this area. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. I want to stop here for a moment. I know we've got a lot of text to read, and I've got a lot of things I want to cover tonight, and I don't want to waste your time. Believe me, I think time is essential, and I, I honor it in people, and I honor you coming out, and I don't like to ramble and just run down trails and chase every rabbit I see. But I also sometimes have to make myself slow down at verses because I know where we're going, and I want to get there. And I know where the screen goes next. And I know the things. That, but there's some things that need to be talked about and need to be said. And so I have to slow down for a minute and do that because I'm learning that by watching Jesus. I've been spending a lot of time in the Gospels for obvious reasons because I want to do this right. And I'm not just spending time in John. I'm trying to spend time in the other Gospels to watch how John is affected by them because they shape John a little bit. They have to. They come before him. How can they not? Um, and so I'm trying to find different angles of Jesus. And it's taken me down some pretty spectacular roads the last few months, and particularly this, this last week. And I, I don't have anything I want to release yet from that. There's some stuff stirring that is actually um, turning into one of what I think will be one of the most effective sets of messages the Lord's given me in a while that's coming out of some of those stories. But what I am seeing as I watch him closely, because I'm starting to watch him move, 
and I'm trying to slow the scenes down and I'm trying to watch how he deals with people and how he listens to them and how he talks to them and how he touches them and how he handles them and when he pulls his hands off of them. And I'm trying to watch for the nuances and the moments. I'm, I'm doing the best I can to jump into the story and be a silent observer and pick up the stuff you, I haven't seen before. And what I'm finding about Jesus is that Jesus spends an enormous amount of time learning. That's not something people expect you to say. Jesus spent a lot of time learning by watching in the Spirit how his Father wanted things to be done. There's all of these moments where he steals away, breaks away, goes to pray, needs a rest, sets on a well, lets other people talk, answers with a question. Why are you doing that? What, when you answer with a question, people go think you're stalling. It's because sometimes you are. Because sometimes the best way to answer a question is with a question because you want to keep people talking. Because if you let people talk, they'll tell you their own answer. And a lot of times people have their answer. They just need somebody to listen to them. They don't need somebody to give them advice. They need somebody to give them an ear. You've heard me say before, God gave you two ears and one mouth because he wants you to pay attention more than you talk. He wants you to listen twice as much as you talk. I say that sort of humorously, but I also really believe it. Really believe that God gives you ears to hear and a mouth to speak. Ears to hear because you need to listen a lot because there's something that you can pick up in people. And Jesus does a lot of listening. Watch and listen. Look at that 19th verse again. I say to you, I can't do anything by myself. I only do what I see my father do. Whatever he does, I do it. And this gets missed because we think Jesus is just being all shucks humble. I mean, he's Jesus. Oh, shucks. I can't do it unless my dad does it. And we go, yeah, he really could because he's Jesus. He just told you the secret to his success. This is his spinach. He's, if, if he's Popeye, this is his spinach. If I don't hear from dad, I'm not going to be able to do anything today. I got to watch father do it. I got to listen. I love this moment because this gives you hope because you get to listen to the father. And Jesus is teaching you how to do this correctly. Listen to people because if you don't, it's, let's start on the, on the practical before we go to the spiritual. Listen to people because People will tell you their heart and people will tell you what they, what they need. And if you pay attention, you will have answers for them. You don't have to be super spiritual and say, let me run off and pray about it for a week. Sometimes you do need to go off and pray about it because you're lost and what do you know? But if you'll listen, they'll tell you things and they're not even always looking for an answer. Most of us implement things far better if we come up with them than we do if somebody else comes up with them. But we come up with stuff talking to people. And, and we call them great conversationalists, even though they haven't said anything. I, I heard a statistic, or not a statistic, but a, a fact this week that uh, the best diagnosticians, uh, doctors who diagnose diseases, now not every doctor's good at diagnosis, right? Some doctors aren't good at it at all. They're good at treatment. They're good at knowing what to do, but they don't know what's wrong with you unless you come in by someone's referral. I'm here from Dr. So-and-so, this is my x-ray and this is what's wrong with me. And then that doctor goes, okay, based on the x-ray, here's what we should do. But being the guy that finds the problem, being, a good, being good at diagnoses, they did a study on the best diag uh, diagnostic physicians. And, and here, this is what they found. I, I thought this was fascinating. The best diagnostic physicians talk less than their patients for the first 15 minutes of their meeting. The worse, the, the better you are at diagnoses, the fewer words you said in the first 15 minutes your patient's in the room. The worse you are at it, the more you talk. And it tells me something. <laughs> well, it tells me, first of all, maybe people like to hear the sound of their own voice that don't know what they're talking about. But it tells me something else too, and that is that maybe... If you listen, people will tell you what's wrong with them. And the Bible bears that out. Jesus is good at saying to people, what do you want? Remember our, I mean, we've seen that even in our John 5 story at the pool of Bethesda. 
do you want to be made well? And then the man goes into a story. <laughs> We're going to get to the bottom of what's wrong with you. It's not going to take very long. So this is an important moment. I, don't, I didn't want to get stalled out there because it's really a minor point in a bigger message tonight, but I didn't want to leave it either. I didn't, I didn't want to just run past it because I think if you'll apply this in your life, you'll be, a better, you'll be a better citizen because you'll pay attention to your neighbor, but you'll also have something of value to offer people because you listen first and then you might have something to say. And you, what you might learn a lot of times, this is what I'm finding out, is that when you listen a lot, you'll realize you didn't have anything to say, and it was really good that you didn't say anything right up front. And if you go into it with an answer, which is how a lot of people deal with a conversation, they only let you talk long enough till you give them a bit of room to jump in and keep talking. And that's usually a bad way to converse. And so pay attention. Now, how, what's that look like on the spiritual side? Listen to the voice of the Spirit because He will tell you what to do. All you gotta do is listen. Don't let somebody mock you for that either, okay? Don't let someone say you're crazy if you think God talks to you. Fine, then be crazy. You know, Paul considered himself that way. He was like, look, if, if, if you look at me from the outside and I'm crazy, then I'm crazy. It's what he told the church. But why does he say that? Because I really believe I hear from God on what to do next, and I think you can too, and you should practice. And why not? Jesus did. And again, don't, don't give me that all shucks, that's Jesus being humble, because I don't buy it. This is his key to success. I don't do it unless dad does it first. If dad doesn't do it, I don't do it. Now, to me, that explains why he goes in at Bethesda and heals one man at a hospital and nobody else. And that's something we didn't talk about two weeks ago. It's a hospital full of people and only one guy gets healed. No one else gets healed because dad walked him in for one man and walked him out with no one else. And I don't understand all the who gets healed and who doesn't get healed stuff, but I can live in this. I can live with the... I do what dad tells me to do. I move where dad tells me to move. And that's where I want to live, and I think that's where we all want to live. All right, verse 20. The father loves the son. He shows him all things that he himself does, and he'll show him greater works than these that you may marvel. That last phrase tells me that Jesus doesn't go about doing miracles just for the sake of doing good. Jesus does miracles in Israel. Mostly, most of his miracles are to Jews. We've talked about that before. They're to Israel. Um, so that people will, be, will, will marvel. It's really to build faith, and it, it works to an extent. It doesn't keep him off the cross. It always works to an extent to do miracles. It usually doesn't work for permanent faith. Jesus is going to have to talk to get people to that, and that's what he's starting to do now. As the Father raises the dead, 21, and gives life to them, even so, the Son gives life to whom he will, for the Father judges. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not skipping 21 because it's not relevant. I'm skipping 21 because it's more relevant for next week. Okay? And so we're going to do some work on resurrection and what that looks like, but we're going to pull some verses like that one and some that we're going to blast through tonight. And you're going to go, why did he skip that? Well, that's why, because you can only do so much in one lesson. Right? You've got you you to you pick your battles. And so this is the one we're going to tackle tonight. So we'll get back to that at another week. For the Father, here's, here's an important text for us. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Pay attention to that. The Father, how many people does the Father judge? Nobody. He's committed all the judgment to whom? The Son. So that all would honor the Son the same way that they honor the Father. That 23rd verse, don't skip that. Jesus says judgment, God, the, my dad's not going to do any of the judging. He's committed all the judging to the son, but he did it so that you would honor me the same way you honor him. If you don't honor the son, then you don't honor the father who sent him. And so I want to take some time and start to follow that ribbon a little bit tonight because there's some things that, that are important along this sort of this John stream that he has, this underlying stream. So start with this thought, the Father judges nobody. The Father has committed whatever judgment there's going to be. He has committed that to the Son. And then look at John chapter 5, verse 30. This is further up, and we'll, we'll work into it over the next few weeks, but I want to start to pop some of these verses in order. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear it, I judge. My judgment is righteous, because I don't seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. This goes back to the I don't do it unless I see it done. What did Jesus say in 23? My Father doesn't judge anybody. He's committed it all to me. What does he say in 30? I can't really do it. I can only do it if I hear it. If I hear it, I judge it. Now, what did he just tell you about the Father? How many people does the Father judge? None. 
I want you to follow me on this, okay? How many people does the Father judge? None. Jesus gets to do all the judging, right? He said, the Father commits the judgment to me. I can't do anything by myself. Who do I have to do? What do I have to do to do something? I have to see the Father do it, okay? I can only judge what I hear. How many people is the Father judging? None. Jesus is doing all the judging, right? So Jesus judges whomever the Father tells him to judge. How many people are the Father judging? Oh, we're going back to that, aren't we? We have to, because that's contextual study. How many people the Father judge? None. Jesus gets to do all the judging. Jesus can only judge what he sees his Father judge. How many people is his Father judging? You're getting the point, all right? And so that's where Jesus is leading you. We get, we're kind of working that patch, bringing you up to stuff like this. Look at John 7. John 7, 24. Don't judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Now, this is an interesting curveball. Now, it needs some context. And John 7 is a long way off for us. When we get there, we'll go real deep into that waters. But let's just dip our toe in right now, shall we? And this context is Jesus saying to the Pharisees who are mad at him, Again, because he's doing something on the Sabbath. We got into that business last week. And they're not happy that he's healing people on the Sabbath. And he says to them, uh, you know, you don't have a problem that Moses demands you be circumcised on the eighth day. What if the eighth day is the Sabbath day? You would circumcise that baby because you feel like that circumcision is important. In other words, it's necessary that that baby get brought into the covenant regardless of it being the Sabbath, but on the appearance, you're working on a Sabbath day. If somebody's on the outside looking in, go, they can't be circumcising that. They can't be in there sharpening that knife on a Sabbath day. And you go, but you know why you're doing it. Because that kid needs to be circumcised. Because he needs to be brought into the family of Abraham on the day God told you to bring him into the family of Abraham. You're going to wait till Sunday. That's nine days. You can't do that. You got to do it the way God said to do it. On the appearance, it looks wrong. Jesus says, but don't judge according to the appearance because a bunch of stuff doesn't look right to you. There's a lot of things going on that you don't understand. He says, so you're not going to judge according to appearance. You're going to judge with a righteous judgment. Most of us, when we read this, we go all the way back to David, you know, and little David's the, the shorty and he's the young one and Samuel's picking his older, taller, stronger, fitter, more handsome brothers to be king. And God says to Samuel, no. You look on the appearance, but I look on the heart. Choose little David. He's my next king. And, and, um, and that's okay context, but it's, I, I like Jesus is better. It's basically you're judging people because they're doing stuff you don't think they ought to be doing, but you don't have any idea about their heart. You don't have any idea about who they are. And so maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe it's a good idea to not determine what people are by what you saw them do. Maybe it's better to determine what people are with righteous judgment. So if there's going to be a judgment, it better be righteous. It better be right. It can't just be willy-nilly, and it can't just be your opinion, and it can't just be what you see. Let's move on. John 8, 15, 16. You guys can't help yourselves. You judge according to the flesh. That's, this speaks right back to the circumcision context from John 7. You judge according to the flesh. I don't judge anyone. Yet if I do judge, my judgment's true. I'm not alone, but I'm with the Father who sent me. Okay. Keep that there. Remember this. How many people does the Father judge? None. Jesus can't do anything if he doesn't hear his Father do it. He says, if I hear it, then I'll judge it. Now, how many people does his Father judge? None. So how many people is he supposed to judge based on what he hears his Father say? None. In fact, then he goes even further because now the story's developing. Judgment as a concept is developing in John. And what does he come up with? I judge no one. I'm not in the judgment business, he says. Well, wait a minute. He said earlier that all judgment had been committed to him. Isn't he supposed to be in the judgment business? What, ju what Acts 17 say? Paul's, in, Paul's at Athens going, God who has, com who has committed the judgment unto the one who will judge the oikomene, who will judge the inhabited world in righteous judgment. It's all been committed to him. We got to get to the bottom of this because there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of divergent paths here. I mean, Jesus says, Dad's not going to judge anybody. He's going to let me do all the judging. And Jesus goes, but guess what? I'm not going to do any judging. I'm not going to judge anybody. So where do we go with this? Look at John 9, 39. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world that those who do not see may see that those who see may be made blind. Now, I don't want to deal too much with the latter half of this verse because we have done that. We've done that on Tuesday nights with other passages. I've done it many times with other sermons. 
the super, super duper condensed version is this. Jesus comes so that if you are, your eyes are open to what it ought to be closed to, he knows how to close them. And if your eyes are closed to what they need to be open to, he knows how to open them. And some Sauls need their eyes closed to being Saul, and they need their eyes open to being Paul. And the Garden of Eden opened your eyes the wrong way. It opened your eyes through your good and through your effort. And God never wanted your eyes open through your effort. He wanted your eyes open through revelation. Adam and Eve were supposed to, I know this is going to sound really, I'm spending more time here already than I wanted to, but this, I got to say this. Adam and Eve were supposed to discover one another's nakedness through relationship. It's the whole point. Supposed to discover, their, the scales were supposed to come off of their eyes as they fell in love with one another. And it happened prematurely. Instead, the scales fell off of their eyes through effort, through works, and it was a problem for them, and it's been a problem forever. And so what we're seeing in us is the need to be released from our own obligations and our own works. Now, I want to deal, though, with the front half. For judgment I have come into this world. When Jesus says the word for, it's the Greek word ice. It's spelled E-I-S. I didn't put this on your screen. It's just a short statement I want to make, but it's pretty crucial, I think. It's the Greek word ice. It's pronounced ice like ice cubes. It's spelled E-I-S, transliterated in English. It's a word that is, um, for the most part, it's a preposition. It's taking us, you know, it's the old, when, you, when your grammar teacher in school says, what a squirrel can do to a tree, up, down, around, in, over. No one else? No one else learned prepositions by what a squirrel can do to a tree? He can go up a tree, down a tree, around a tree, through a tree, over a tree, under a tree. No? Gosh. Okay, well, what a squirrel can do to a tree, that's a preposition, kids. <clears throat> and a prepositional phrase, you can go through it, up and around it, over it. Okay, um, this is a preposition. And the English translators used the phrase for because as far as they could see, Jesus came for a judgment. But I think the translators messed you up because the word ice is not the majority of times, over a third of its usages in the New Testament, twice as much as it's ever used as any other preposition, it's used as the word into. Your translators would have helped you here if they had said, into judgment I have come. Because according to where we're going to the cross and according to what Jesus has already told us, he didn't come to judge, he come to be judged. So Jesus is saying to you, into judgment I came into the world. And this to me starts to change the meaning of the whole idea of the Father has committed all the judgment to the Son. Instead of it being He's committed it to me to go do it, it's He's committed it to be in me. I'm where it's going to happen. Now, how do we know this? Can we prove this? I think we can. Look at John 12, same book. Three chapters later, John 12, 31, 32, 33. Now, here's a timing word, by the way. Now, when is this going to happen? Now, not in 2019, but at the time Jesus says this. Now is the judgment of this world. If you don't remember anything I say tonight, and that's very possible because we're, we're not real good audio learners. We have to listen to things over and over and write them down and read them. If you don't remember anything and you get in your car with one thing, remember this. Jesus believed, and if you believe Jesus knows what he's talking about, you should believe the statement as well. Jesus believed that the judgment of the world was going to happen in his day. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world is going to be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I'm going to draw all. And that, I've said this a hundred times to this group but I'll repeat it. It needs repeated. The word peoples, the word men is italicized. It's not in the Greek. It's an English edition. If I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all, put, put a block over peoples. It's not there. I will draw all to myself. And so you end up with all of what? And the only word that makes sense is he said, now is the judgment. Now the ruler of the world's cast out. If I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all the judgment to myself. Whatever I, I'm here for, I'm going to take all of it. And the lifting up of Jesus is what we covered in John 3 when he said, as Moses lifted up a serpent on the pole. And we covered this verse when we covered that verse. We're back to that. And we'll get to it again 
Praise God when we get to John 12 in a year. We'll be right back on it again because it's so important to realize that Jesus believed he was at a judgment, at a crossroads of judgment in his day. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of the world is cast down. If I'm lifted up from the earth, I'm going to draw all of it to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. That is the lifting up. Signifying what death he would die is the cross. And so he's, as the snake's going to be lifted on the pole, Christ is lifted up to be judged. What have we discovered? What we discover is Calvary is a lot of things, okay? But at its root, Calvary is God judging evil and sin in the body of Jesus. Calvary is not God judging Jesus. Calvary is not God killing Jesus. He doesn't need to do that. The empire kills Jesus. His own people sell him out so that they can get out of the old covenant for 30 pieces of silver. All of that. He goes to the cross as a sacrifice. Why is he a sacrifice? Because he has to lay his own life down. Because he holds life in the palm of his hand. He can't just die. So he has to give himself to say, I will go on their behalf. Because evil dominates them. Evil dominates you. And it wins if it's not judged. And Jesus comes so that God can judge evil at the cross. Evil still exists on the earth. Malevolence still exists on the earth. Bad things happen on the earth. But a judgment against them was exacted at a place called Calvary. Paul believed this because Paul says this in Romans 8, 3. What the law couldn't do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. Look at those last six words of Romans 8, 3. He condemned sin in the flesh. Whose flesh? Christ's. Not yours. If he condemns sin in your flesh, you need to die for your own sins. So Jesus comes for a lot of reasons, but Calvary becomes the place of an exacted judgment. God judging evil and sin in the body of Christ. All of it being poured into Christ. All of it being taken care of in Christ. All of it being committed to Christ. And that takes us back to Acts 17. Remember this. Paul says this. We started here. God appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. What did he ordain him for? Don't just skip that. Well, he ordained him to be judged. Jesus said, into judgment, I've come into this world. Now's the judgment of this world. If I'm lifted up, I'll draw all that judgment into me. Whatever judgment God had, he put it all in Jesus. When Jesus says the Father judges no one, he meant it. The Father's going to judge all evil and sin in me, and He's going to leave it all inside of me. And I get to do what I can with it, what I want with it, what I must do with it. By the time Paul says this, Jesus has already died at the cross, but Jesus is also raised from the dead. The assurance that everything is going to be put in its proper place comes when Christ comes out of the grave. Because that is God saying, I approve. All judgment has been exacted into Jesus. I approve. I don't have anything left to judge I put it all in Jesus. And Jesus comes out of the tomb as an assurance that he will judge the world in righteousness. He will judge the world of that day in righteousness. And the world of that day being judged in righteousness happened. In fact, I put this up because I have a few statements I want you to see. A generation of people was judged in AD 70 because Jesus said it must be that way. Matthew 23 34, 35, 36, Jesus says the blood of all of the prophets from Abel until Zechariah shall be exacted upon this generation. Your house is going to be left unto you desolate. In other words, there's going to be a judgment against those of you who for the final time have rejected God's prophet. It must happen. That generation died. It also is prophesied in Matthew 24, 34. What's Jesus say? Remember Matthew 24 was the verse where they say, what's the sign of the end of the age? And Jesus says, this is going to happen, and 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 that fall of a system was prophesied by old man Simeon, Luke chapter 2. You remember when they bring little baby Jesus into the temple? 
An old man Simeon's been waiting on him and now he can finally die. He holds little baby Jesus up before the father and he says, this man, this boy shall be for the rise and the fall of many in Israel. What's that mean? Well, the rise part we get. The fall part we jump right past. We shouldn't. Because what Jesus came to do was so that people could rise up within a system that had crushed them and he could knock down the system that was crushing them. Jesus came to lift up those who had been oppressed and to knock down the system of oppression. And that system was a mosaic system. It was weak in its flesh. Remember Romans 8, 3? For what the law could not do and that it was weak in its flesh. Christ did. God did in that he condemned sin in the flesh of Christ. And so that oppressive system had to go. And here's something else I want you to see. God is still the judge, but his justice has already been exacted. And it also now flows out of Zion instead of Sinai. Let me explain what I mean by that. There, there are, Sinai represents the Mosaic law. It represents a law of performance and works. Justice ran swift at Sinai. So swift, in fact, that the Bible says that if an animal touched the base of the mountain while God was on it, you shot the animal through with a dart because you couldn't use that one in sacrifice and you better not eat its meat. It's worthless. It's clean become unclean because the, the mountain's so holy that anything that touches it needs to die. That's the justice system of Sinai. God's justice, justice system is now Zion and any future judgment, now I want to tell you about future judgment, any future judgment must flow from a mountain of grace. It cannot flow from a mountain of performance. How do I know? Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, 22. But you have come. Stop, don't go any further. Just remember, just realize that the word but's rebuttal. So what come in front of this is important, I, but I know me and I thought, well, I read all those verses will be here all night. So what comes in front of this is, is you have not come to Mount Sinai where there's darkness and blackness and tempest and thunderings and lightnings. And if an animal touches it, he's shot through with the dark and killed. That's the mosaic economy. Instead, here's where you are. You've come to Mount Zion. You're not going to Mount Zion. You're not someday marching to Zion. As the old song said in church, you're not just over in the glory land. You get to go to Zion. You have come to Zion. You've come to the city of the living God. You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn that are registered in heaven. You're, it's not that you're already in heaven. You're, you're in a church that's registered in heaven. You, you're, in a, you're in a piece of heaven because you're at Zion. You're at Zion. I mean, how can you not be? To God, the judge of all. He's still the judge of all. Even on your mountain, he's still the judge of all. But what does it look like? Spirits of just men who've been made perfect. And Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. What's the blood of Abel say? This is where you really got to dig in. You got to dig your heels in if you're going to figure things out in the Bible. This business of somebody walking up, well, do you believe in this? And you figure you can answer it in 15 seconds. Who do you think you are? And who do they think they are thinking that anyone can answer those questions in 15 seconds? I mean, don't we want more than this? The Bible is a deep book and the river runs very, very deep. This is an amazing statement that I preached this in a meeting here a while back. A meeting full of believers who've been in it decades, pastors, and we walked up to afterwards and never in my life thought to dig in and figure out what the difference was in Abel's blood and Jesus' blood. And I wanted to say, why not? Hebrews 12 has been in your Bible all the time and you're supposed to have been living on this mountain. Don't you want to know how powerful the blood of your Jesus is? So just take a time out for a moment and realize that when Genesis tells you the story of one brother killing another brother, and that's the classic sort of biological issue of sibling warfare that Genesis is trying to lay out for you. He doesn't kill, he kills him out of just straight up jealousy that he's not able to be what Abel is and he's not accepted in the way Abel's accepted. And Abel's blood cries out and the blood cries out, come and get him. And God does. And shows up and says, where's your brother? I don't know, my other brother's keeper. Yeah, where you're supposed to be. Abel's blood's vengeance. Because God sets in a... God turns around to everyone left living and goes, new law, kill somebody, you die. Where'd he get that idea? Abel's blood's crying out. Somebody needs to die for me. 
And so God goes, okay, here's how we're going to do it. You kill someone, you die. Did you know kill someone and you die doesn't start at Sinai. It starts in Genesis. Go read Genesis. So one of the early laws God gives is blood for blood. So you kill, you get killed. Abel's blood is vengeance. What's Jesus' blood? Whatever it is, it's better than that. And that's a good place to start. So what's happening on your mountain? God's still the judge, but remember, Jesus said, God's not going to judge anybody. He gave it all to me. What's Jesus? He's a mediator of a new covenant. And it's built on the kind of blood that's better than the blood of Abel. Because the blood of Abel is you get what you deserve. But the blood of Jesus is you get what you can never deserve. Because I paid for you. I paid a great price for you. I mediated a new covenant for you. The new covenant, is better, it's a better covenant. It's built on better promises. It doesn't require anything out of you. Just faith. Just believe me. Any judgment that's coming in the future, whatever it looks like, I don't tell God, who is the, still the judge, that he can't judge the future. Who am I? But I do hold God to the standard that he told me he holds himself. Any judgment that he has in the future comes through Jesus. And any judgment that comes through Jesus comes through the cross. And any judgment that comes through the cross deals with blood. And any blood judgment can't give me what I deserve because that would be God dipping all the way down and acting as if he's able instead of being who he is, a mediator of a better covenant. Here's some hope I like to give people. Look at Hebrews 9. This is a popular phrase. A little bit of this is read in, so let's read in. Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. And now he appears in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often. As a high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, he's not going to, just one time. He doesn't need to die again and again and again. Because if so, he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. Why? Because we've all been sinning a whole bunch. So if Jesus has to go in there and ask every time, then we, this is going to be an endless revolving door. But now once at the end of the age, uh-oh, there's that very important ages word. By the way, that's ion. Jesus, the author of Hebrews is saying Jesus has appeared once now at the end of the age. This is all about to come to an end. This age of Hebrews. I love 27. How many of you have heard 27? It's appointed a man wants to die, but after this judgment. Heard that verse? Used to use this at funerals all the time. Heard that, I've been in funerals my whole life because I was raised in a pastor's home. My dad did a lot of funerals, did a lot of weddings, did a lot of revivals. If it happened in a church, I saw it. And every funeral I ever went to, somebody read Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed a man wants to die after this judgment. Oh, brother so-and-so up here was a good man, but God, he had a day of death. God appointed a day of death for him. He has met that day of death. Now we can know by the word of God that he's now meeting his day of judgment. But don't worry, he doesn't have anything to worry about because he accepted Jesus. So when he stands before the judgment tonight or yesterday or whenever he died or however God does it, it's going to be okay because he's accepted Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. And so he'll be fine. He met his day of death and now he's met his day of judgment and all is well. But how many of you realize that at the end of verse 27, there's not a period, there's a comma, and that's because the sentence isn't over with. So let's read 27 and 28 together. And it's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered how many times? Once. I think the author's doing something there to you. Did you catch it? If it's appointed for you to die once, how many times did Jesus die on your behalf? Once. Jesus met your appointment. This verse is not about everybody needs to die one time, although we all know we're going to die. It's not what the verse is about. It's appointed to men to die, so Jesus met your death in his death. What about the judgment part? It's appointed to men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. What was happening to the sins in his body? Romans 8, 3 says they were condemned. What's condemned? Judged. They were judged in his flesh. Christ met your appointment with death and had your sins judged in him. It's been appointed for you to die once and then get judged, but Christ died once to bear your judgment. So any future judgment can't ignore that or it's not a just judgment. It has to come through the one to whom judgment has been committed. So we wind up back in John 5. Here's our next verse. This is the one we didn't read. This is right after our last, we read through 23. Watch 24. Most assuredly I say to you, 
and we'll really nail this next week. He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has already passed from death to life. You're still alive. I mean, to God. To God, everybody's alive. That's what the book of Luke says. We'll throw that one in next week. We'll, we'll put that on the screen for you. In the book of Luke, Jesus, Jesus says, to my Father, everyone is alive. Even dead people? You, hear me. To my Father, everybody is alive. In other words, he doesn't lose any of them. He knows where all of them are. You've already passed from death to life if you believe on Jesus. Your everlasting life starts now, and you don't come into judgment. Now, you can't answer that question in 15 seconds. What do you feel about a future judgment? You need to dig your heels and do more work. And you need to be fair to the text because it's deep. But I'll leave you with this thought. If you're struggling with this verse, what part of shall not come into judgment don't you understand? That's what I ask people. What part of shall not come into judgment are you struggling with? Be it unto you according to your faith. That's a Jesus thing to say. People said to Jesus, can, can this happen? You go, be it unto you according to your faith. So I say unto you. Be it unto you according to your faith. What part of shall not come into judgment are you struggling with? I hope you're struggling with none of it because judgment's been committed to the Son. Now, couldn't we go farther tonight? Of course we can. There's, you can go into a master class on what the rest of the New Testament says about judgment. We're not trying to exhaust subjects. We're trying to do them justice and do them honor. The exhausting of subjects is for another time. And, and personally, I don't think people come in the middle of the week to have a subject exhausted. So dig in. Take this to heart. If you've had struggles with judgment, reevaluate it in light of the fact that it all happens through Jesus or it can't happen at all. That God's justice system has filtered through Christ and what He's done for you at the cross. And anything else is a perversion of true justice. And so, while there's tributaries and little streams and things we can go down and we will as we work, this is a good place to stop. Think about judgment as committed to the Son. Let's pray. Let's, let's try to apply that through. Let's just let the Holy Spirit apply that on our hearts. Father, lots of good word tonight that, that you put, I think you put in us to put into your people. But more importantly, a lot of good roads to go down. I don't think every question is answered, but maybe we're starting to ask the right ones. And I'm becoming convinced as I get older that it's more important to ask the right questions than it is to get all the right answers. So, Father, as we ask these questions, may we at least be resolved that judgment has been committed to Jesus and that whatever the future looks like, it has to happen through Christ and flow from Zion. If our ideas of judgment are still flowing from Sinai, from our performance, then, Father, help us to reevaluate them in the light of your grace. In Jesus' name.